Support for the Capital Connection comes from New York State United Teachers, working to support students, educators, and public schools as the center of their communities through the Public Schools Unite Us initiative and United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. It's the Capital Connection. Hi, I'm David Gustina. With us this week, he's back again, the Republican New York State Assembly Minority Leader, William Will Bark from the 120th District. Leader Barkley, I welcome you back once again to the Capital Connection. David, thanks for having me on. I want to start with a big compliment to you and to your staff, because when I call and I ask you to come on and talk to me about the issue from your perspective, obviously the Republican side of the aisle, you being in leadership, you have never refused. You've come on, you've okay. spoken your piece, I've asked you the tough questions, you respond to them, and I appreciate that. And I can tell you right now that there are many lawmakers on both sides of the aisle, including the governor, who I can't even get their staffs to respond and to come on. And okay. I've, I've talked to you, I see this program as an opportunity for those public officials to speak to their constituents across New York about the issues they're concerned about. So, I compliment you on your willingness to step into the foray and have a legitimate discussion about these things. Well, I appreciate that very much, David, and I appreciate you having me on your show. Your predecessor, Dr. Shartok, I remember when I first became leader, he invited me on the show, and I have to admit I was a little nervous because I didn't know what to expect, but uh, he was always very uh, forthcoming with his questions, but I always thought very fair, even though we probably were from different ideological backgrounds, and you've carried on that great tradition, David, so I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak my mind and give my opinions and share my thoughts on New York State government, and uh, you've always treated me very fairly, and I would encourage, whether it's the governor or other legislators, to do the same. I think it's part of our duty and our job as legislators to share our views with New Yorkers, and you certainly give me a vehicle to do that. And, you know, despite it seeming like the meaning of the Mutual Admiration Society, there's a big point here, and I think it's not lost on everyday Americans, that we're in such discord. We're so divided in this country right now, and it takes people like a Will Barkley and others from both sides of the aisle, obviously, to step into the meeting room and come to some compromise. At least from the polls that I see countrywide, most Americans are upset with particularly Washington, but the idea that we can't come together and solve problems. I couldn't agree more. You know, one rule I've talked about that uh, on the show that I have is I don't take anything personally. Uh, I understand that people with different uh, viewpoints in the state, they serve very often different constituencies that uh, maybe I serve or others in the legislature serve, and that's fine. But ultimately, we have to try to govern the state and try to implement good public policy. And in my mind, that very often takes bipartisan. Certainly, uh, as me and a Republican, I'm a very blue state uh, where Democrats control uh, almost all the levers of, of government, uh, it's, it's indicative that I work in a bipartisan manner in order to get something done. But I, I, I have had success working with Democrats in the Assembly. Um, and so I think that ultimately, when we do something in a bipartisan manner, very often can lead to better public policy and you know, better uh, governance for New York State. Yeah, to your point, when one party has the majority over the other party, they tend to use that power like a hammer, no matter who it is. And <laughs> that means many in the minority do need to get their message out. And part of that would be certainly speaking on this program. I want to get real serious now because we have an issue known as climate change. It's affecting the planet. We saw two of the hottest days ever on record this summer. We've seen record tornadoes in New York. We, of course, have been experiencing lots lots of flooding and more importantly, flash flooding. And, you know, our infrastructure can't handle it all. But at the same time, we have this growing problem with the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And it's not just a partisan issue. This has to do with the goals in New York's landmark climate law, the act, of course, calling for New York to obtain 70 percent of its electricity from renewable energy by 2030. And reaching those goals is not easy. To that end, you've seen the State Public Service Commission and 
draft report in July say they will not be met those goals. You've seen the controller also coming out with reports about this. The independent system operator in New York talking about the risk of blackouts in the middle of the next decade unless substantial new generation of power comes online. Also, the Business Council of New York State came out and has said that we need to pull back a little bit on these goals or at least have a discussion about how we're going to pay for them, which is not in the Climate Act. So I throw it to you, Will Barclay. The governor has called for a climate summit. I'm hoping all people will have a seat at the table and we can come to some agreement because the climate's not going to stop warming. Right. Well, first of all, this may be one of those bills that well, it's good intention, but in reality, it's pretty unworkable. We've been saying that since the CLCPA was passed, that we should do a cost benefit of this and really find out what we can do in a realistic sense. I think sometimes the idea that New York, in our, by limiting our emissions, somehow is going to have a big impact on global uh, warming, or uh, we only are we are only responsible for something like. 0.4% of all the global emissions. So as I've said, if, even if we're successful in you know, stopping any emissions from New York, it's really not going to have an impact uh, on global emissions. So you got to wonder, you know, what is the purpose of spending this money when the impact isn't going to be all that great? The one thing I am pleased that the governor now realizes, and a number of those groups that you mentioned have realized that the implementation of the act is probably unrealistic. And that's what we've been saying all along. Let's take a pause. Let's see really how much this is going to cost. It's going to cost, it's got to be paid by somewhere. It's going to be paid ultimately by the rate payers. And, um, you know, see what kind of effect this is actually, benefit this is actually going to have. As you know, David, and I've mentioned it many times on the show, when the wind isn't blowing, uh, the windmills can't generate electricity. When the sun's not shining, uh, solar energy cannot uh, generate electricity. Uh, really, the only uh, consistent non-emission um, e- energy generator is nuclear power. And unfortunately, many of the people that are pushing the CLCPA don't want, and they want to shut down all the nuclear power that we have in New York State. But, but will, but will, won't uh, that be a part of the yeah. discussion? Won't that be a part of the climate discussion? I, I believe I read I, recently I that that uh, New York Governor Hochul is not necessarily out on the issue of nuclear power. Right. I'm happy to hear that. And I think a lot of the, um, you know, I call them environmentalists, so the people that are pushing to stop any emissions out of from New York state electrical generators now are recognizing the fact that nuclear, you know, does have a role in that future. So I'm very, very pleased with that. And I support that. But ultimately, the, it'd be great if we had, Uh, electricity storage capacity that when the wind blows, we can generate electricity and store it in batteries and use it at a later time. Unfortunately, the technology is not there. And so we're going around, we're throwing up heavily, very heavily subsidized wind and solar uh, facilities, all mostly in upstate New York. Uh, But ultimately, as I said, when the wind doesn't blow, the sun doesn't shine, they can't generate. So they're kind of stuck. So when you look at how, where our electricity comes from in New York State, those two sources are, you know, have been stuck at like 4% of all the electric, electrical generation in New York State, and they can't get out of that. So we, because, you know, they're kind of, it's a static thing. They, they can build more, but they can't generate more because, you know, some, we have cloudy days in New York, and they can't generate during those days. So I think that ultimately, I've said this all along, reality is going to set in. And I think reality is setting in, particularly when the people are on the front line, like the ISO, like the PSC, and others, realizing that we have increased demand for electricity and we're not building reliable uh, electrical generating facilities that can meet that demand. Yeah, and at the same time, there's more pressure on the electric grid, especially in the summertime when it's hotter and hotter and hotter. And my question would be a more pragmatic one here, and that is, what about infrastructure? Can't you guys agree on that? So, for example, if we're having these storms wiping out roads and creating landslides that end up on the Amtrak tracks and stop the train, shouldn't we be, as you get together, say, well, what can we use the money for that's pragmatic and also help with climate change? For example, improve Improving our infrastructure. Well, even putting aside the impact, but just generally, you're right. I, you know, you see report cards that different groups put out grading New York's infrastructure. And we always grade 
sadly, very low. And, you know, I'm a Republican, I'm a fiscal conservative. I believe that we, you know, government should be limited. But the one thing I can strongly support is investing in our infrastructure in New York State, because that helps everything. It helps the economy, it helps individuals, it helps the working man and woman. And it seems to me that's a very legitimate purpose of government to spend money on infrastructure that will benefit the community as a whole. Including saving lives, I would argue, especially if instead of going into the culvert that we build to protect people from the flood, the flood runs through somebody's house and they're killed because they're in the basement. Right. Or just the general, I mean, that's extreme, obviously, but just the property damage and cost because we don't have that proper infrastructure in place. So it's one of those things, too. I think if we make the investment, very likely we can save money in the long run. So myself and the Republican conference has always supported infrastructure projects and improvements. So, you know, we're big advocates for the CHIP program, which is a consolidated highway improvement plan that provides state money to localities to upgrade their roads or maintain their roads. And that's always been a fight for whatever reason in the legislature to make sure that that program is properly funded. And I have many members in our conference that have really been leaders in that speaking out. And we've been successful in increasing the investment into that program. Well, I hope you all are able to get together and come up with some understanding and solution going forward. I do want to bring in, because you mentioned environmentalists, but those aren't the only people that are not happy with the move to renegotiate the Climate Act. I'm quoting now Robert Howarth, Cornell University climate scientist. He takes a different view. He says, quote, I'm appalled at this pushback against the CLCPA by business interests pushing their short-term agenda. He says, climate change is very real. The consequences of climate disruption, floods, droughts, fire, crop failures are becoming increasingly obvious to all. Quote, the political leaders of New York understood these dangers when they drafted the CLCPA and its predecessor beginning 2015. Due to political delay, we may miss the targets by a few years, but the trajectory remains clear. If you look at the scientists, their point is, it's fine, New York. It's fine, whatever state you're in, but it's planet Earth. And if the tipping point happens too much, we're really going to see a lot of damage. And if we think the problems are bad now with losses, What's going to happen if we continue to delay dealing with the problem? Well, I appreciate the good professor's thoughts on that, but no one has addressed the idea that New York only emits 0.4% of global emissions. So we can spend billions and billions and billions because that's what it looks like it was going to cost and not do anything about global emissions uh, in the world. So again, my point is, look, there's nothing wrong with trying to get emission-free generation. I think we all would support that. It's good to have a diversified energy generation state anyways. Solar certainly have a role in that. But to set arbitrary deadlines and then to try to shut down our current energy generating, electric generating facilities is a recipe for disaster. And when you're in government, sometimes you have to look at things realistically and you can't get carried away with some dreams of what you want. I mean, people need electricity in New York State. We have to come up with a plan of how to provide that electricity to them. And sometimes that's not exactly the way, you know, the environmentalists or the professor they want. But we have to live in reality. And I think, unfortunately, the CLCPA took a step out of reality. And that's why we have to put a pause on it. Well, I appreciate you sharing those thoughts. That is, of course, State Assembly Minority Leader Republican Will Barclay. And we are on the Capital Connection. I'm David Gustina. Well, let's move on to another subject, and that has to do with something that you have been talking about lately, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, or ERAP. You have issued now a second letter to the controller urging an audit of the ERAP program. How come? Well, because the money hasn't been going out in the amount of shit. This is a program to help landlords be able to cover their costs when it really started during the COVID thing, when their tenants couldn't pay the money. And unfortunately, the ERAP program, they haven't gotten the money out. And then there's looks like there's been some fraud in the program also. So this money's already been, it's, you know, it's already a policy in place. Uh, we want to know why that money hasn't been flowing, why it and if it has been flowing, is there any fraud in the program? It's just simply good governance, and you know, we feel strongly that the controller ought to look at it. And we did, to tell you the truth, uh, to the controller's credit, I did hear from the controller the other day, and I just haven't had an opportunity, I'll be very, very honest with you, David, to look at what his response is, but I'm optimistic that he can look into it and we can get some answers to some of the problems that we have with the ERAP program. He seems to be a pretty straight shooter, in my opinion, when he does his audits. How about you? Yeah, I mean, 
generally, again, he's a Democrat, I'm a Republican, but that doesn't make him the devil. And actually, as I've mentioned many times in public in speeches I've given when he's in the room, that I actually had the opportunity to vote for him when he was going to be appointed. You know, when Hevesy um, had to step down, the legislature gets to appoint right. the next controller. And so I voted for him at that time. I like to remind him of that. I'm sure he remembers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, every time I mention it to him, I know he remembers it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you're there to remind them. The issue here, of course, rent, housing, right? This is a huge issue, and there was a housing deal in the budget. One of the other things to come out of that is good cause eviction. Now, is it me or did the pandemic, because of what happened at that time and the assistance for people who needed to pay their rent and this emergency rental assistance program you just talked about, some of that money's gone away. You know, there's an argument, depending on what side of the aisle you're on or who needs to be more protected, the landlord or the tenant. I think both do, but good cause eviction. Now you see communities, yeah, usually city areas like Kingston, for example, opting in. What's your sense of that? I think it's a big mistake. I mean, we've seen the housing crisis we have in New York City uh, where there's just simply not enough um, housing for people. As a result, rents increase. Uh, Government gets involved. Uh, They try to put caps on rent. And uh, as a result, uh, the supply of rent or housing goes down. And then anything that's not covered by government um, control Uh, those prices skyrocket and people can't afford it. So my general opinion on this is government getting involved doesn't help the situation. In fact, it will make it worse. And certainly good cause eviction, which essentially says you can't evict anybody unless there's good cause of victim. And by the way, uh, you can't raise rent uh, only by a certain percentage uh, going forward. So it's basically government inserting itself into a housing market and ultimately, it will stop anyone that wants to invest in you know, building new housing units uh, from doing so. And again, why would we want to take the policies that clearly are failing in New York City and put them statewide? It doesn't make any sense uh, to me, uh, other than people believe that government can answer and control all these situations. And my feeling is uh, if we pass good cause emissions, it's just going to make matters worse, not better. What about- and frankly, you know. In my area, for instance, I haven't heard anybody concerned about, I mean, obviously people are concerned about rents, but this is an issue that seems to be generated with a good cause eviction uh, by interest groups out of the city that are trying to flex their muscle throughout New York State and try to implement this bad policy, not only that come out of New York City, but throughout the state. And I think that's a big mistake. Well, of course, it's not a you know a new issue, really, when you talk about rent. Remember that candidate from New York who ran right. on the rent, it's too damn high party? Yeah, <laughs> right, right. But David, let me just say, there needs to be a balance. Yeah. And certainly there needs to be tenant protections. I don't think anyone's against this, but you can't push the lever so far one way because that's going to get anyone out of the rental business. In upstate New York, for instance, a lot of the landlords are you know, mom and pop people that you know want to rent out you know, an extra room in their house or to make a little extra money, and maybe they own a couple of units. To put them under these auspices of this, which really rent control, the good cause eviction, they're not going to do it anymore. Yeah, it's like when you talk about the big corporations often benefit way more than the small businesses. It's the same kind of a thing, right? You got small renters and you got big renters, giant buildings with multiple units. And it's a little bit easier there, perhaps, than if you just got one small place. Without a doubt. The problem is having government make the decision. Often government doesn't do a good job of making that decision. So it's a dangerous policy, I think, and I certainly don't support it. We move on to a little bit rapid fire. I've got a few questions to ask you, get your quick responses. There's prison closures going on. One in particular, Washington County residents recently banded together for a rally against the announced closure of the Great Meadow Correctional Facility. We are talking about a maximum security facility that employs 559 staff and houses almost 500 incarcerated individuals. The Department of Corrections and Community Supervision says dramatic decline in prison population led to this decision to shutter the facility. Now, you can understand why people are going to lose their jobs or upset, but it's kind of strange to me. I mean, this is prison. If there are less prisoners, were those prisons put up state as economic generators and, and should prisons be used as that? Well, yeah. It's a question of the timing. It's supposed to take a year to close or be proposed, have public hearings. So everybody has a say in you know whether this makes good policy to close these prisons. Each year in this past year, we allowed the governor in the budget, we put language in there and allow the governor to close up to five prisons with only 90 days 
prior notice. So a lot of this stuff takes, whether it's the employees, the community, whatever, by surprise. And then they only have 90 days to adjust to that. I think that's wholly unfair. The reason the law initially said a year was so people could digest this. There could be somewhat of a public debate whether this is good public policy or not. And then at least they had a year to make plans if they wanted to change a plan. So right. the idea that this is sped up to 90 days, I think, is problematic. I think there are legitimate reasons to question whether we have, you know, oversupply of correction facilities in New York. You talk to the Correction Officers Association, and they they can tell you, you know, you've seen violence go up in prison, and they can say the reason is we're, we're now putting more prisoners in certain prisons or correction facilities, and there's not enough correction officers to watch that. I think people often think of prison. I used to until I got into politics. You know, you have bars in front of you, two people in the cell, and the prison guard goes down with a baton, you know, going down, making sure everybody stays in control. But, you know, that's not how it works. In these prisons, there's usually one or two correction officers, and there are about 30 prisoners all in one room. And unfortunately, there's been a spike in prison violence. And I, they would claim, and I, I would agree with them in most cases, that some of this is caused because of the population in some of our prisons. So there's a constant push by the state to try to save money and close these prisons. And I think there's a legitimate debate can be had whether that ultimately is good for the inmates there and it's, and it's ultimately good for the correction officers. Running out of time fast, Will Barkley. How about congestion pricing? I meant to get to that earlier. You, politics means strange bedfellow. Senator James Scoofus, I spoke to on this show recently. He is not for it. He's upset because Orange County, which he represents, doesn't even have a train that goes directly into New York City. He said, you know, $15 to go to lower Manhattan, that is a tax. And that's on top of what it costs to go over the bridge and the gas. And we don't even have a train. So, Right. You know, <laughs> and if you look at the governor's move there, right after coming out of a climate gathering with the Pope and she says, no, we're suspending this. And of course, that made a lot of environmentalists and certainly the folks with a budget down in New York City a little bit upset for where they're going to fill the hole. I'm pleased the government paused the congestion pricing. I agree with Senator Skubitz, and I encourage him to look at all the other government programs that are taxing regular New Yorkers and forcing them to leave the state. But congestion pricing, again, whether it was done for environmental reasons or really done for revenue reasons, I think is up in the air. They predicted that congestion pricing was going to raise something like $15 billion in the cash-starved MTA. So some will say, well, we're doing it for very more reasons, but I think a lot of it was done just to get another revenue source for the MTA. And unfortunately, that revenue source was going to come from hardworking New Yorkers and other out-of-state people coming into New York. And it wasn't cheap, $15 to enter below, I think, 61st Street. Does it matter to you, Will Barkley, that the New York Times editorial board will no longer make endorsements in New York elections? Well, of course, I was expecting their strong endorsement for my re-election <laughs> campaign. <but. laughs> Good and I always, you know, I always agree with how they come out with their endorsements. Uh, <laughs> crushing blow to us that they're not doing it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how much they matter uh, at all, quite frankly, to most people, no matter who's doing right. it. Well, let's exactly. go. Let's go to the big topic, which of course impacts New York. That's a presidential year election, and you were at the Republican National Convention. This is after a horrific assassination attempt on the former President Donald Trump. No one wants that, and if they do, they could go find somewhere else to live. But let's raise questions about how that was all handled. But in general, your thoughts on this now new race, because at the time you were there, you were expecting Joe Biden to be your opponent. Right. Well, you know, I think uh, races ebb and flow. And going into that convention, by the way, I've been to a number of conventions. I thought the production of that convention was one of the best I've ever been to. The party appeared unified. People were on message. I thought some of the speeches were terrific. So that was really uh, very energizing and exciting for me to hear. Then, obviously, right after the convention, they swapped off Joe Biden, which, by the way, it still doesn't seem to be enough coverage of whether he should continue on as president he can't run for re-election because they don't think he has the mental acuity to do so. Doesn't that question the idea of whether he should still continue on at present? Now, somehow that just seems to have been lost in this whole change. But as I said, elections go up and down. Harris certainly has received a bump. She's kind of the new person in town. 
uh, even though she's been vice president for a while. But I think as voters start recognizing her record, particularly maybe New York State, not as much, but throughout the rest of the country, they're going to see that she's probably out of step with most Americans on what she advocates and have been very quiet on her positions on big issues. I think generally her campaign and the Democrats don't want the public to realize how extreme she actually is. She was, I think, the second or first biggest liberal senator when she was in the U.S. Senate. So maybe she's had to change her heart. I don't know. But I think it's more out of political convenience than anything else. Is it give you a little more worry that we have a woman, a woman who is a mixed race and, you know, not the sort of easy target of an old, outdated, maybe not capable of doing the job Biden? Well, without a doubt, the matchup you know, the Biden-Trump matchup, and particularly after that horrific debate, that was certainly favoring Trump. I don't necessarily think running against a woman for Trump is the problem. I just think the campaign has to do a better job of getting out her positions. The Republican Trump campaign needs to get her position so the public understands what she stands for. And also, I would, if I was them, continue to push for failure as the borders are and the problems we have with migrants and people streaming across the border, I think she has some liability on that issue. And that ought to be, I guess, for lack of a better word, exploited by Trump and the Republicans. Well, as I recall, she went down to the border. She looked at everybody and she said, turn around and go home. So I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure what she did. That was so bad. But in any case, you yeah. have spoken. You have shared your thoughts. You have done it as usual. And you make me want to talk to you for another hour. But we're completely out of time. I've already gone over time. And I apologize. We've been speaking with Will Barkley. He is the New York State Assembly Minority Leader, a Republican, and a really decent fellow. He cares about politics. He cares about the state. And he's willing to come on and talk to us about the issues. Hey, nobody has to agree. We just have to have a conversation and try to compromise. Will Barkley, thank you so much. Thank you so much Thanks, for being David. with us. Always great talking with you. Yeah, have a good rest of the summer. Thank you. You too. The Capital Connection is a production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. You can listen to The Capital Connection anytime at wamcpodcast.org or anywhere you get your podcast. And join us again next week at this same time for another political conversation. For The Capital Connection, I'm David Gustina. Support for the Capital Connection comes from New York State United Teachers, working to support students, educators, and public schools as the center of their communities through the Public Schools Unite Us initiative.